Well, and a pleasant good morning to you this Saturday morning. This is Russ Barkley back again with another weekly research roundup. This time we have three papers to talk about. There wasn't as much published in the past week as there had been in weeks before. But as always, before we do, here are some really bad dad jokes for you. This week they're coming from the website of menshealth.com. So here's your first one. Where do pirates get their hooks? Second hand stores. Got to think about that one. Here's one you really got to think about. Of all the inventions of the last 100 years, the dry erase board has to be the most remarkable. <laughs> okay. And what do you call a line of men waiting to get their hair cut? A barbecue. All right, that's enough before you really get on me about this stuff. Let's move on and talk about our research for this week. First up is going to be a very nice paper by some colleagues of mine. Uh, and this is a study following children over time using two very large birth cohorts over in Norway involving over a thousand children. And what they're looking at is from between four to 16 years of age. They're looking at children who had high levels of inattention versus high levels of hyperactive and impulsive symptoms. They followed them up over time to look at the relationship between those symptoms and risk for anxiety symptoms and anxiety disorders. So following from preschool to adolescence, what did they find? They found that in girls, early symptoms of ADHD inattention, the more they had, the greater the risk for developing anxiety about two years or more later. However, when they looked at the girls at that second follow-up, they looked at, did anxiety also predict worsening of inattention? And the answer was yes. So there's a reciprocal relationship in girls between level of inattention and later anxiety and later anxiety and more inattention. Kind of a bi-directional effect if you want to think of it that way. In boys, it was quite different. They found that it was early hyperactive and impulsive behavior that was predictive of anxiety two years later. However, anxiety was not predictive of any ADHD symptoms that is a worsening of those symptoms going forward. So no reciprocal relationship there, more of a unidirectional one between hyperactive impulsive symptoms and risk for later anxiety. All of this fits in very nicely with earlier studies that have shown that ADHD in children increases the risk of having an anxiety disorder, both currently, but especially over time. The longer you follow up individuals with ADHD who go untreated, the greater is the likelihood that when you follow them up later, they will have an anxiety disorder. For instance, about 20 to 25 percent of ADHD children have an anxiety disorder. That figure rises to 40 to 50 percent or more in adults with ADHD. So, a very interesting and further replication of some relationship between early ADHD symptoms and later anxiety. Okay, my next paper is one that comes from the Journal of Psychiatry Research, this one done in Israel. This is a very interesting study because as you know, we've seen a lot of claims that the lockdowns associated with the COVID-19 pandemic that those lockdowns were associated with a marked increase in the diagnosis of ADHD in children and in adults. Is that true? Here is a study using a very large population in Israel. We're talking here of, oh, let's see, I think it was several million cases that were followed over time. And they use computers to generate what the monthly rate of diagnosis was before the lockdowns and then projected that forward to see what you would predict those rates to be 
and then what were the actual rates of diagnosis after the lockdowns? And was there a difference then? In other words, did rates of diagnosis and rates of treatment increase? And in this particular cohort that goes back 20 years of data from this particular uh, area of Israel, this particular medical center, what they found is that there was no significant change in rates of diagnosis or treatment following the pandemic lockdown based on what would have been predicted knowing earlier patterns of diagnosis and treatment. So here's a study that does not corroborate what we're seeing in the trade media claiming that there was substantial increases in rates of ADHD after that, as if the lockdown itself or the pandemic uh, and its management was a cause for worsening of diagnostic rates and treatment rates. Apparently not, at least not in Israel. Finally, there's another study, this one coming out of China, and this has to do with, yet again, the relationship of mothers smoking during pregnancy and risk for ADHD and learning disorders in their offspring. This article examined and, and compared mothers who were smokers, who continued smoking during the first trimester and then quit, versus those who continued smoking through the second and third trimesters, versus those who quit before they became pregnant or when they were first identified as pregnant, and then they had a typical control group. What did they find? Compared to non-smokers and their offspring, maternal smoking during pregnancy did increase the risk of ADHD about twofold, and LD also about twofold in the offspring. However, in the mothers who quit later in their pregnancy, uh, there was also an increase in risk. It was only in the mothers who quit smoking or quit during the first trimester that we see the odds of ADHD in their offspring are less, still higher than normal, but less. So their point is that maternal quitting smoking in the second or third trimester did have a significant increase in risk of ADHD compared to the first trimester mothers who quit. Overall, they're suggesting that the longer into pregnancy a woman smokes, the greater is the risk that there will be ADHD in their offspring. Now, many people in epidemiology and public health might rush to conclude, as these authors did, that we should be discouraging smoking during pregnancy as it causes risk for ADHD. Well, that's a good idea. But remember, these results are purely correlational. What is not explored in this study, but is very important to do so, is whether mothers who smoke are more likely themselves to be ADHD. And it's their ADHD that is conveying the risk to their offspring. And it's their ADHD and how severe it is that's determining when and whether they are able to quit smoking during their pregnancy. After all, we have other studies that show that it is the mother's genetic risk that accounts for the risk to their offspring and that maternal smoking during pregnancy is just a marker for the mother likely having ADHD. It's not the smoking, it's the mother's own genetic risk. So while it would be nice to have some further research on this, I think the authors draw the wrong conclusion from correlational data without giving consideration to other studies that are more genetically informed, as we would say, about the risk of ADHD in parents and whether that is what's accounting for smoking during pregnancy. All right, everyone, that's this week's research roundup. I appreciate you joining me this week uh, and hope that you will recommend this channel to others and consider subscribing if you're not. So I'll see you next week for more commentaries and research reviews. And until then, be well, live well, and take care. Thank you.